Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations and, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're talking about why, why we are, in, in many respects, uh, behind the curve in terms of, of uh, pay equity um, with special guests, Gloria Blackwell, Chief Executive Officer of the Washington, D.C.-based American Association of University Women, Emily Martin, Vice President for Education and Workplace Justice at the National Women's Law Center, also in Washington, D.C., and Lori Wolf, President and CEO of the Four Acre Group in Alaska. So thank you all for joining us. I'm so excited that that you're here to discuss this, this issue, which, which really is, is hidden, and I'm going to unhide it. How about that? Women earn less than men in nearly all occupations, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. 82.3% of men overall. And if I were a Black woman, then I'd likely earn 70% of what I currently earn now as a white man. So earning less because of gender and only because of gender is not what America should be about. That is wrong. So we're going to talk about the problem itself and how to correct it. And uh, let's start with you, Gloria. How do you frame the equity challenges that women face in the workplace, Black women face, Latino uh, women face, women of color uh, face in the workplace? Thanks, Mark. I'm really happy to be in conversation with you, Emily and Lauren, talking about the pay gap. We know the pay gap is real. We know that it's indisputable. And the research tells us that, that it starts right out of college, it compounds throughout a woman's career. And that's a key driver of why so many women live in poverty and retirement. So AAUW really takes a multi-pronged approach to addressing the pay gap. We look at it through research, which is key in providing the data so that we have the information to make informed decisions, uh, the simple truth about the gender pay gap, and also very specific research around systemic racism and its impact on the pay gap and how the pay gap disproportionately impacts black and brown women. We also go through the channels of advocacy, state and federal level advocacy, to really get at the root of the legislative causes around why the pay gap is so persistent. That includes advocating for the Paycheck Fairness Act uh, and making sure that we're working on everything from laws about salary transparency, uh, to actual equal pay laws, and also the way in which we really need to educate all women, particularly those women who don't have access to information about how they can really understand their, their true value in the workplace and get that information. So we have a number of education and training programs. Our work smart salary negotiation programs are key in providing women with the information that, that they need. But we know it's really not just about, it's not about fixing women. It's really about addressing all of the systemic issues that really pervade our workplaces and that have a disproportionate impact on black and brown women and the systemic racism and sexism that really intersect to really have such an impact that Latinas and African-American women have a wider pay gap. It's going to take longer to close. And it really does have an impact on everything that um, takes place in their work and also obviously um, trickles on into their personal lives. We so know I'd, like to, I'd like to deconstruct cause, uh, Gloria. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go to, to, to Emily because this is something that that you know, we, we all say pay gap and we all nod, nod sagely. We all say discrimination based in gender. We all nod sagely. We all talk about discrimination based in race and systemic racism. And we all nod sagely. But we need to really deconstruct the problem in order to solve it. Emily, could you uh, guide us a little bit? How do we take the data that we can collect on this issue and move that into actual, actionable items? Emily? Could you give us your, your take on this issue? Yeah, I think one of the reasons why we talk about the gender wage gap so much is because it really is a measure that captures a lot of different drivers of 
gender and racial inequity in the workplace. So one cause is just simple paying women less for the same job because of gender stereotypes and discrimination. That is definitely a piece that is driving that 83 cents on the dollar number when we do matching for particular occupations and experience, et cetera, women consistently are being paid less than men, even in this day and age. Another driver of the wage gap, though, is that women are overrepresented in our lowest paid jobs, and women of color are especially overrepresented in our lowest paid jobs. And that's a reason, one reason why things like a low minimum wage that hasn't budged in, in well over a decade um, is part of the reason that there is a gender pay gap because women are more likely to be in those minimum wage jobs and women of color are especially likely to be in those low paid jobs. Another driver is women's disproportionate responsibility for family caregiving. So women are more likely to have gaps in their workforce participation because of childcare. The past couple of years has really thrown this into stark relief as our caregiving infrastructure broke down and so many women felt like they were the safety net and had to step back from work, either reduce hours or leave the workforce entirely as schools and childcare suddenly were not places that were taking care of children during the day. Um, and those spells out of the workplace tend to lower wages when you come back. And this is also one of the sources of stereotypes and discrimination. Employers tend to see mothers as less competent, less committed to their jobs, and tend to pay them less as a result. Those are some of the pieces that we look at when we think about what is driving the wage gap and why do we see bigger gender wage gaps for Black women, for Latinas, for Native women in particular. So we have, we have an information uh, gap, but but there's a, a point that you made, which I thought was really interesting. What you're what you're indicating is that we actually systemically devalue certain types of work that ought to have a higher value. And because those that those types of work are are often associated with um, with caregiving or certain activities um that that are very often occupied by women we kind of attitudinally shift the the compensation down just as a society it could be me as a man but it could be you as women just devaluing that particular type of work and saying well that's that's just not as valuable as another type of work is that is that part of what's going on Lori? Well, I think that's part of what's going on, but I think, you know, and just to expand uh, a touch further from what Emily and Gloria have shared already, which is such important points, you know, we're also, um, many generations right now in the workforce are also taking care of their parents. So we're taking care of younger children and we're taking care of our parents. And in a pandemic situation, that is only exacerbated on both ends of that continuum. So I think there's, you know, the expectation of women um, to be juggling um, all of those caregiving roles and working full time and in many cases for many women working multiple jobs in order to make all of that happen. Now we're talking about, you know, a pandemic lens on top of that. And I think anyone who's been on had the, the moment of being on Zoom, you know, has had a glimpse into we all have Zoom screens on, right? Because what's really going on in the background of our lives? And for many of us, we've been watching all of that play out, right? Children and elders and all of those um, all of those caregiving roles on top of trying to balance balance in the workforce. I think there's lots of other issues that we could contend with as well. I mean, these are these are not simple. Um, they're not simple solutions to this to these issues. Um, and we can talk about kind of lack of retirement. We can talk about lack of uh, you know family leave. We can talk about lack of flexible um, work like work um, uh, employee rules. We can. There's many many issues that feed into this. Um, I would also say in the nonprofit space, which is the space that I uh, spend my time in, you know, we are predominantly, there's more women than men um, until you get to the larger organizations and then you find more men, but still in our boardrooms, we have more men than we have women. So, you know, I think we have to really talk about, these are not simple solutions. Um, these, um, these require very conscious conversations uh, that we all need to be having. You know, we just completed a, a, a poll, really interesting. Um, we asked which 
um, professions likely have the largest uh, uh, gender pay, pay gap. And we included merchandisers, research assistants, social workers, environmental specialists, professors, computer programmers, um, C-suite executives, restaurateurs and chefs, and pilots, where the uh, respondents got it right were um, very, very big pay gaps in C-suite executives and pilots. And frankly, as long as I have a good pilot, I don't care if, if what gender orientation, identity my pilot is, I want the pilot to be great, right? I mean, that, that doesn't make any sense that there should be a pay gap, does it? I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. Here's what, what was interesting. Chefs, restaurant tours, is also a very, very high pay gap profession. Um, it's, it's just so interesting. So if, if we're going to, let, let's take pilots for an example. If we were going to attack this, Gloria, right? If I was a black female pilot, and uh, or if I were a female pilot instead of a male, my wage by data is actually lower. How do we attack that? I think it's important that we have the facts. And like you say, if the data demonstrates that you as a female pilot with the exact same qualifications, you know, professional expertise are being paid lower, we would recommend that you address that with your employer because, you know, so many of the ways in which these gaps have been kind of allowed to persist is the fact that, you know, you know, women are reluctant uh, to bring them up to their employers. And also employers are, are aware of how their compensation practices are inequitable, but they aren't always, you know, given any motivation to change them. And so when we look at things like salary negotiation, which AAUW um, is, is, you know, really a champion of, it's about knowing your value, about really looking at, the, looking at the market because every job has a market value of making sure that you are prepared with the information to justify and to support that ask and to really make sure that your employer understands that what they are doing, you know, is inequitable, um, making sure that you know that you are as highly qualified and, you know, you can make the case and you can, you can prove it, but also demonstrating that how things such as paying people who do the same work, who have the same qualifications, you know, is unfair, you know, these practices, you know, definitely provide so much, um, you know, ways in which we are still hiding behind screens, both in nonprofits and in, in corporations. So you, you make the case, you demonstrate the value you bring, you look at it as a win-win, as you are going to continue to always deliver the value that you have delivered in your profession, and also give employers an opportunity to really look at their own internal compensation practices and what that says about how that employer values the work of its employees. But if I can pay a class of workers less as a company, I can move that that money into my profit line. Right? How do how, how do we deal with that? I mean, yeah. let's say you're talking to me and I, I care about profit. So I'm incentivized to actually pay you less because you're a black woman. If I can, if I can get away with it, right? Because that's that that difference is going to go into my profit line. Emily, you wanted to? Yeah, I think one of the real challenges that we have in addressing pay discrimination is that so often there's this culture of secrecy around pay, and so that gives employers a lot of space for a potentially discriminatory discretion, and it means that. Individuals can be victims of pay discrimination and have no idea, which is different from something like sexual harassment. Um, and so one of the important solutions for closing these wage gaps is moving to a culture of greater pay transparency. And that's partly through um, cultural shifts for us just becoming more comfortable talking to each other about how much we make. But it's also a really important place for policy. So the National Women's Law Center, also AAUW, a lot of organizations that care about equal pay have over the past several years really been focused on how can policy help shift this. So some states, for example, have recently adopted provisions 
that require in job announcements, you include a salary range. And that really makes a difference. It is a message to job seekers about where you might want to start in negotiating. It requires employers to think a little bit beforehand about how are we paying for this job and to put some markers down rather than just operating from an often uh, discriminatory gut feeling. There's also really important work to do in requiring employers to report pay data by race and gender to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is the part of the federal government that enforces pay discrimination laws, because that sort of pay data reporting really shines sunlight on pay practices. It gives employers a real incentive to fix disparities that they can't justify. And it gives an enforcement agency very important information that they don't currently have about which employers have race and gender wage gaps that on their face look concerning. So those are some of the answers for how do you correct for its employer incentive to pay people as little as possible and to take advantage of uh, discrimination in the job market. The flip side to the, what Emily's just said, which I, I again agree, agree with so much about really just normalizing the conversation. I think if we, we demonize it, then no, everyone just checks out. So, you know, I think we, for example, we post a job board, we require you can't post a job, which the job postings are free, but you can't post a job there without listing the, um, the pay um, scale, which is a signal to the potential employee about yeah, you know, their worth and the, whether it's worth everyone's time to apply for the job. So there's there's lots of intrinsic pieces in there. But it, I think there's another piece of this, which is, you know, you ask, well, they're trying to get away with something. Well, what about the employer, um, which many of our organization, nonprofit organizations, you know, they don't have the, the, the latitude in their funding agreements um, to meet, um, uh, to increase. So they've noticed that there's a pay gap. They I can identify the problem. They can see it clearly. And they don't have the financial flexibility because they don't have the, um, the operating budgets to meet and end the pay gap. So I think we have, you know, we have to see this in, for the complexity that it is, which is that, you know, it's not that everyone's trying to, you know, do a you know quick one and, and do something wrong. I think lots of our organizations, they see that there are problems, but they don't have the financial flexibility to fix it. And I think those are organizations where we have to start talking about, like, what are the incremental changes we can make? How does just having the conversation and saying it out loud? What does it look like to talk with our granting agencies? What does it look like to raise the issues? What does it look like to even validate for your staff what the issues are without trying to open yourself up for a potential lawsuit for being sued for pay discrimination? So how do we bridge those gaps and have those conversations um, in a place where you can't always immediately fix a problem that you can see? You know, I'm, I'm of mixed emotions. As somebody who recruits nonprofit leaders um, and have been, has been in uh, business and so on, I'm of mixed emotions about a lot of these these um, these solutions. But there's one solution that that I think is really clearly advantageous for everyone, and that is transparency. The whole idea of sharing information and everybody uh, working off of the same level playing field. I I would love to see transparency in compensation for all publicly traded corporations in the same way that it's provided for uh, nonprofits. I think that would be a huge shift. Uh, Gloria, in, in addition to that, which and you mentioned transparency, so did Emily, so did Lori, what is the next thing that we ought to do? And we all have to do an attitudinal shift as well, right, around caregiving and so on. But what is the next thing? What is the next thing that we can advocate for in our own personal lives, for our neighbors, for our colleagues that we ought to be doing? I think part of it, thanks, Mark, is really, it's not just about transparency. It's also about those of us who have the ability to advocate and to lift up and educate and provide information should really be sharing that information. You know, we have these laws on the books, but what is a law if it's not being enforced um, for letting people know that, you know, there are employers and laws on the books that say you can't be you know, you can't be penalized from, for talking about your wages. You know, that people should be normalizing talking That's about That's really interesting. Could you go into what kind of penalties there are for people talking about their wages? Well, so, so for example, there are employers who, through, through the years, who can basically sanction individuals for talking about 
uh, what they're being paid with their colleagues. And so it's becoming certainly in laws and in, in many states that employers can't prohibit you from talking about your wages, that they, you know, employees who have been wronged and who have clearly proven that they have not been paid adequately, uh, you know, they're working on laws so that they can recover those lost wages. Uh, you know, really looking at things like banning salary history in the in the hiring process, uh, which is a clear driver to the pay gap, right? So these are all things that people people should know about if you're going on an interview and you're working in a state where you can't ask someone what they earned at their last job. People should know those things. And so education, I think, is really important. So it's that cultural shift. And it's also sort of a, a mind shift around what we have seen as the old normal in the workplace and what was acceptable in talking about salary and what really needs to happen now. And I think a really important part is the fact that to close the wage gap, you know, not only do these organizations need to be modeling this kind of behavior, but they need to have people in place who are representing women um, across the spectrum, you know, particularly in leadership roles, because the leaders are the ones, you know, who set these policies and who often perpetuate so many of these policies. And if we're really looking at improving diversity, equity, and inclusion more broadly and holistically, it really starts with making sure that the leaders themselves um, are having a place at that table and helping to make these compensation decisions. Lori, um, Four Acre is so well known for your use of data. What is your data telling you about, about other um, measures that we could take uh, to, uh, to attack these problems, really concrete actions that we can take? Thanks, Mark. I I'd love to talk with you about that. I want to add one piece here, which is a moment that, of our own res, uh, realization around data, which is, you know, one of the recommendations that we make for organizations is that they do some compensation studies so that they can actually under, start to understand. Well, one of the things that we've realized, we, we do a compensation study of the nonprofit sector every two years for our state. And one of the things that we realized was that we were inadvertently perpetuating the pay gap because we weren't having the conversation about the gender disparity, uh, uh, we weren't naming gender, we weren't naming race, we weren't, and, and that's just, you know, our own revelations around, oh, well, this very tool that we had been recommending for so long, which was deeply rooted in data, in fact, was actually perpetuating the very problem we were trying to solve. That's so you, interesting. So, so you I think you have to, you have to reconcile that. You have to say it out loud. You have to then go when you, when we can pair it up and with our data and, and know that there's a pay gap in a particular field that like there's um, the CFO space in the, in the nonprofit sector is a classic place to look for a pay gap. And um, so we know that if you're gonna use a salary study on the nonprofit C CFO space that you have to, you can't use the mean, you've gotta go to the top of the pay scale and grab that pay scale. Otherwise you're gonna perpetuate the pay gap. So while I am very much rooted in our four acre is very much rooted in our data to action. We, we, we love our data and we'd like to, Think about data and turning it directly into on the ground action in our organizations. We actually have to be mindful that some of the data is perpetuating the problem. So that's that's really interesting. What you're saying is that can be a kind of data hubris that causes its own blindness. How, how did you identify that you were doing that? Did, did you get um, criticism from your constituents, from from members of the community? Did you do that yourself? How did that work? Lots of conscious conversations about how all of our work fits together. So we do a lot of work in executive transition. We've been doing this work in um, salary and benefit compensation for almost 20 years. And this work that we've been doing um, uh, around the pay gap for the last decade or so, and the just coming together, thinking about, well, you know, these are systemic issues. So what are the systemic tools that people are using? Because we too in Alaska are advocating for uh, uh, pay equity laws. And so looking at Colorado and Washington state and looking at the tools that they're talking about and really just trying to figure out, you know, how do we not be part of the problem, but part of that solution and really on the ground um, taking action. So we do offer, you know, uh, concrete steps for every piece of data we put out, like in the pay gap, we have concrete steps that everyone across the country can take um, and we have generative conversations that boards can have because I think, you know, this is an anchor. This is a journey for many organizations. They're not ready. You know, they can identify it. 
they, they still have to just have the conversation in their boardroom. So we've created steps, really concrete steps for people to take no matter where they are in the journey. I'll also just say, because we're three women uh, having this conversation, we need more men to have this conversation. Straight up, every time Four Acre has these conversations out loud, it's all the women that show up and we all nod and smile at each other and agree that this is the problem. We need more men to have this conversation with us. Well, that's why I wanted to place myself in the crossfire. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I wish I could just press a button and 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 create the right solution, but sometimes we just don't know what that right solution is. Emily, um, we just ended a, ended a, a, um, a poll which um, first asked what the, what the biggest issue is. And there were two issues. The biggest one was transparency. Second one was the idea of caring mm -hmm. professions uh, being devalued. I, th I thought that was really interesting. And we've got a poll going on right now. And, and the question is, how much time should employers have to end pay disparities once they are identified? And we've got about 13% uh, saying uh, no more than a year, up to two years uh, received about 38%. And then the third answer was the issue is way too complex to, to regulate in, in one way. Uh, what is your take on how much time? Let's say I know that there are pay disparities in my organization. I employ a thousand people and I know there are pay disparities. How much time do I get? What's reasonable? I think it really depends on what we mean when we say pay disparities. Like there are some pay disparities that are clear violations of federal law. And I think you need to fix those right away. <laughs> there, are other, there are other disparities that may be driving an overall gender wage gap in an organization that aren't necessarily a violation of any law, but that show that point to um, the fact that maybe women and women of color are overrepresented in the lower paid roles and men are overrepresented in the higher paid roles. That may or may not be because of unlawful discrimination, but it does point to a need to think about recruitment, about ladders of opportunity, about how are you um, growing um, earning capacity for people across roles. And so there, I think, it, yeah, that that's a, a process that organizations can and should undertake that might take a little longer. But if you're talking about paying someone less for the same job without a justification that the law recognizes, unfortunately, you need to fix that right away. <laughs> or fortunately. So you're, you're, in the, you're in the not one size fits all camp but I think also not giving giving a, a, a pass. Uh, Gloria, could you give us a, a comment on that particular issue of, of how we ought to aggressively address this issue uh, in a way that also embraces that kind of difference in circumstance? Thanks. Well, obviously, all employers really want to, you know, they, they want to do the right thing. You know, they see the value in fairness and having a just and equi equitable workforce. And so I think we really should give credit to those who do these studies and who want to make sure that they're that they're paying folks fairly. We want fairness is what we all want. Equity. We want to give women an equal shot, everyone an equal shot. And we really would love to rid our entire society and our employees and our employers of the, those barriers that exist that that hold women back. And so taking the first step is important, but I think also, you know, in examining your compensation practices, but give credit to those who are really trying to have an impact or trying to take that first step and understanding that having the study is the first step, but also just keeping, uh, you know, keeping the employees informed and really showing as an employer that you are invested in, in that change but also being transparent about how it can or cannot move forward, you know, on a timeline that, you know, employees um, can be happy with. It really is about coming together to have that very challenging conversation because ultimately, you know, both the employees and the employers, you know, should have the same goal when it comes to the mission uh, and of the organization. Uh, everyone wants a, wants a fair shot in, in equity. And I just think that, you know, we all have, come to the realization that the old normal wasn't working. And, you know, we're just excited to be able to participate in helping to create a new level of work, life, uh, family balance and equity uh, for women uh, as we move forward in our careers. So thank you. And, and Laura, you have the last word. Take us out. 
Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. I think this is a really a, such an important conversation that we're all having. And I invite so many more everyone that's listening to continue to have these conversations in their boardrooms and with their staff. Um, let's not be afraid to have these conversations. Let's make them conscious. Uh, it's the only way that we're going to work through both um, conscious and unconscious bias uh, to get to a better solution for everyone. So thank you so much for covering this, this topic so thoroughly. Gloria Blackwell, Chief Executive Officer of the Washington, D.C.-based American Association of University Women, Emily Martin, Vice President for Education and Workplace Justice at the National Women's Law Center, also in Washington, D.C., and Lori Wolf, President and CEO of the Four Acre Group in Alaska. This has been just a fantastic conversation. Please thank your, your staffs, your board, your funders, your supporters, um, I'd like to also thank the attendees for participating in the polls and prompting me with uh, with questions. And we will have another discussion uh, next uh, um, uh, 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 Thursday on diversifying the field of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and ensure that representation is, is uh, guaranteed in those fields as well. Thank you so much. Everyone stay safe, and we'll see you on Thursday.